happy to be here. My name is Monsignor Ed Drizedek. That's my title. I prefer the uh, the um, uh, an identity called Father Ed, but the title is Monsignor, which is a nice title. But my identity is more being a spiritual father in the Catholic Church, and uh, a lot of my years is uh, that of a priest. But anyway, you've asked me where I began and. Uh, I was born in 1930, and uh, from a combination of a German father and an Irish mother, which was rather common in St. Louis in the turn of the century on. Uh, my father's name was Alvin Griesedick, and his father was Joseph Griesedick. And they came from a beer family from a little town in Stromberg, Germany. And a number of the Griesedicks came over to this country in the 1800s and started different breweries in St. Louis. At one time, three different breweries, one called uh, Griesedick Brothers, another called Stag or Griesedick Western, and the one my family was involved with called Falstaff. My father uh, married uh, in the, I guess, the early 20s, 1920, maybe before that, uh, a wonderful uh, Irish girl named Mary Elizabeth O'Donnell. And uh, between the two of them in their lifetime uh, sired eight children, of which I'm the, the fifth of the eight. Uh, a sister younger than I, a year younger, died in a car accident and coming from a college in Florida in 1950. But all my other six brothers and sisters, three sisters, four, three brothers, all married and uh, brought about about 39 nieces and nephews. And they, uh, many of them married, so I'm a proud uh, uncle and granduncle of <laughs> 39 nieces and nephews and maybe uh, 60 to 80 grand nieces and nephews. Anyway, that's my beginning, but I didn't come into, I, I was baptized a Catholic, uh, as, and my father, who was not Catholic, was Lutheran, but when you married in those days a Catholic, an Irish Catholic, you had to become Catholic, which today we do not recommend that a person be ever forced to become Catholic, but in those days that was kind of a cultural thing. And my father accepted it and became a very good Catholic. Uh, <clears throat> So I was raised in the best of, uh, you know, uh, let's call it a, a wealthy and well-to-do family that provided very much for us. But my father always tried to impress upon us that uh, we were blessed with, uh, with success in, in the business that he was uh, head of at the time as I was growing up, Falstaff Brewing Corporation. But that we were no better than, than the, the bottler or anybody else on the street or the people who served us including African-Americans or people of different ethnic backgrounds. So I had good training and good, good bringing up in uh, some pretty good uh, values, especially, I think, um, values of justice and fairness and, the, and uh, certainly a Catholic bringing. I was sent to Catholic schools, grade schools high schools. I had a little trouble with my father in the middle of all my high school years as I got into my rebellious stage and he figured I needed to go away for a little discipline at a Catholic boarding school. Came back and finished at St. Louis U High and then went on to Georgetown and then went on to Cornell to finish college where my brother and parents had gone. Right. Uh, I was uh, what I call the second tier of kids. The first five came uh, in, you know, in a year and a half or so apart. And then there was a period of about five years that I was born and the younger sister and brother. And I make that distinction because the, the three of us were raised rather differently. By the time I was uh, beginning to realize I had siblings, they were in high school, college, and getting married. So they were almost more of aunts and uncles to us. Uh, my, my mother was a, a very uh, quiet, shy, beautiful woman. I hardly have any memories of, uh, of conversations with her. I have many memories of her loving me. One of my fondest memories is she would walk me down, walk with me down as a, as a toddler or a young 
five or six year old when there was a little chapel in our neighborhood that the, a neighboring family had built. They had a son who was a priest, so they had this little separate building, like a little church. And I remember going down and praying in this little chapel, and I attribute sometimes my vocation coming from those experiences with my mother. My mother was deeply rooted Irish Catholic. And it was a kind of deeply rooting that even whatever tragedies would happen in the church and whatever human frailties would never shake. That's who I am. And to this day, that's kind of prevail. I'm saddened sometimes by what happens with human beings, but uh, but I, uh, I believe this is my identity to be a practicing Roman Catholic and all that goes with it, including the Eucharist, sacraments, etc. But... I got into a culture of kind of with high school and college of uh, what I call a culture of, of non-limit uh, alcoholic beverages. We were in a culture of heavy drinking beer. That was our family to begin with. I used to have lots of, we used to have a lot of parties that my father was very tolerant. My father was a very outgoing personality. He was opposite from my mother. My father had a great singing voice, a great personality. He was a civic leader. Uh, at parties, I remember they had good friends and lots of parties. My father would be the life of the party. So uh, opposites attract in marriage, and certainly my father and mother were good examples uh, of that. So my, uh, I'm very grateful for my father. I found out after he died, one of his friends said, oh, he was so proud of you. And I, like many men of my era, I, I wish that he had expressed that. So it was trust in me, but very busy. And so I think I, I have some memories of growing up kind of lonely, what we call in our business of spiritual direction, the father wound sometimes. I don't want to overemphasize that because uh, uh, my father and I got along very well. But in rebellion, I went through an independent stage and he was firm as he should have been and uh, decided I needed a little uh, training and uh, I guess obedience or whatever. So like many kids, high school kids, I went away and learned uh, that things were pretty good at home and made the little joke that's often made how much my father had grown and learned in my year away, how much I had learned to accept him. Um, I went on to college, went into a secular college and uh, began to kind of get into the drinking crowd and the, began to enjoy in life the uh, success of being uh, fairly intelligent and doing well in studies and beginning to date and beginning to enjoy the company of uh, both men and women, certainly uh, dating, beginning in high school. Uh, some sort of pretty serious relationships that beginning to look like as I got out of college, I was uh, in the ROTC to avoid the draft and was sent out to uh, California to a base out there, spent two years there Kind of, they really didn't need us, but we were kind of doing things that helped in some way. So I recruited people for this Air Force Flight Test Center, Sam Edwards Air Force Base. And did lots of running around and not the best, most Christian lifestyle. Mm. Kept still going to church, but, but uh, more of a Sunday Catholic and not so much of a practicing uh, Anyway, when I got out of college, I was supposed to go back to work for the company, Falstaff Brewing Company, and I asked my father if I could uh, do a lifelong dream, and that's take a sailboat from California to Florida. Make a long story short, he had a great trust in me. He said, well, Eddie will do okay. He's, and everybody else said, isn't that a little dangerous? And don't you worry about him? No, he's fine. He will find his way. So, uh, that's a long story that I think would take too long to get into this uh, session. But God's providence led us through many adventures and some near wrecks through the Panama Canal and supposed to meet my family in Naples, but got lost in the Caribbean. Finally ended up hitting Cuba and going down to Jamaica. And uh, finally, a uh, brother-in-law and sister joined me there, and eventually we got to Florida. So that ended a year of kind of a 1956. Oh, 19, yeah, 55. So anyway, so I started working for the False Step Brewing Corporation, started dating seriously, thinking of marriage. I got close to two or three women, but uh, things 
didn't seem right. One woman I thought would be my wife, but she felt called elsewhere, which now I look back as a blessing. <laughs> uh, and so around that time, I decided to get a little more serious about my faith and, and became active in my parish and a ministry called Legion of Mary, where we called on families or whatever. So out of all of that, there was a retreat given at the uh, retreat uh, that in, in, in the pastor said, why don't you go on this men's retreat? So it was out at the Passionist uh, Retreat Center in Warrington at that time, and the person who gave the retreat happened to be an expert in vocations. I had no knowledge of that. This is what I call God's providence. Been throughout my life, God has always provided for me people and steps along the way. So at that retreat, I just mentioned that at one time in high school, I thought of being a priest. And he said, thought about it. What about now? And I said, well, it's too late. He said, it's never too late. And I said, well, I have not lived a very Christian life. He said, God can do wonderful things. Some of the great saints were <laughs> didn't live a very Christian life. So he encouraged me, and, and how he motivated me to do this, because it was a big step for me to step out of my job and tell my friends I was going in the seminary. He said, you probably won't make it, but you, 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 the rest of your life you'll wonder, I could have been. So get that out of your system. Go try it. Well, he was a wise man because uh, he said, I'll just lead you to the next step. And then God, so I got into the seminary. They sent me to a place in western Missouri called Conception. Uh, they wouldn't even let me go to the present seminary that I'm now working at. But uh, some joke is that I would contaminate the young men with my, because I was age 28 then. So uh, it turns out I was two years there. I ho hoped, thought I could get through there in one year. But he said, no, because you went to Carnell, it'll be two years here at least. That's kind of a joke in a way, but it's a... So then the diocese sent me to Catholic U, to a seminary there for theology. And uh, I still had some struggles. Was I called to this or not? Because um, living celibacy was not something that I maybe felt I could do. Uh, living without a spouse or whatever. So I even took a year out. And I thought the archbishop would say, uh, maybe that's enough. Maybe you just ought to, maybe you're being called to pursue another way of life. But he said, no, I think you're called to be a priest. So went back and was ordained in uh, April of 1965, which is now 50 years ago. And assigned to a parish. My mother at this time, my father had died in 61 while I was in the seminary of a heart attack. And my uh, mother became an invalid with a rare nervous disease. So she was being cared for by uh, nurses and some of my sisters and brothers. Anyway, my first assignment was a parish near where I where she was in an apartment. The, the diocese kind of put me near that I could look after her, which I did. I visited her every day. And for the first five years, it was right after Vatican Council II in 1965. It ended in 65. So I was very encouraged as a young priest to implement all of this new direction the church was going on, the time of the laity, you know, the time where the clergy and the religious were not to be the, uh, we were to be those who served the people who were sent into the world, namely the laity. They were the main wants to be the evangelizers of the world. And so I love that role, um, but I had to deal with a, a disorder that I had picked up as part of my family. Uh, of my eight brothers and sisters, five of us became uh, alcoholics, succumbed to a, kind of it's a family disease. And so um, for many years I was able to kind of hide it. They didn't detect it even in the seminary, but it was there. Now, we, if I knew then what I know now, we would have sent me to treatment earlier. <laughs> but, and I'm very grateful, the diocese, uh, you know, after I had a few uh, incidents of um, alcohol-related um, uh, driving situations and some uh, being intoxicated at a wake, it was enough to get the bishop's attention, and they sent me, thank God, to a place where I could get the help I needed. It's called uh, Hazleton in northern 
Minnesota. Anyway, it's one of the great blessings of my life because it's there that I found through the 12 steps. Uh, came to believe I was powerless over alcohol. My life would become unmanageable. That I was, uh, I began to know uh, a higher power, which I began to identify as the Holy Spirit. I guess I knew about God, but it was not in much of a relationship with God, especially the Holy Spirit. So after uh, being there a couple of months and getting into a recovery program, I had a relapse after a year. And so in that relapse, it was still a blessing because I still suffered from depression. Depression is a, was a kind of a, the, the emotional component of alcoholism. If you drank, you came out of depression or whatever. So I learned a little bit about that. And one of my prayers was, uh, Lord, uh, give me a new wine. The old wine isn't working. So I was led out to a prayer meeting uh, that was beginning in the, uh, this is 19, uh, I was in treatment in 1968. So in the early 70s, the charismatic renewal was beginning in St. Louis. And so somebody said, a woman who was an older sister of a friend of mine kept calling me up and says, Eddie, you've got to go out to visitation where there's having this wonderful new Pentecostal charismatic renewal and I thought that was crazy <clears throat> but she kept bugging me so much I compared to the widow you know that kept saying to Jesus you know and just to get rid of her that's not Jesus but that's the story of the judge finally succeeded so I said yes to this uh, and I went with her and uh, again to make a long story short uh, they asked me at the end of that meeting if I'd like to be prayed over for uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I said something like, well, this is crazy, but, uh, and I really didn't, uh, I had lots of negative thoughts about it. And I said, well, okay, anything. So a lot of people put uh, what I call today kind of laughing, sweaty hands all over me, and then they prayed these uh, prayers that I thought were just uh, mumbo jumbo. Uh, and then a little voice in me said, this is crazy. But another voice said, no, this is, you need this. And so the deeper voice uh, had me be open enough to receive. But as I left, I had felt nothing. So I guess I felt like, I guess it just didn't take. But a couple of days later, I began to have this little trickle within me of wanting to praise God. And I thought, that's not for me. And recognizing that most of my life had been negative thoughts, I said, I want more of that. So I began to go to deepening the life in the spirit seminars. And they had one for priests that I was part of. And that was beginning in 1972 of the greatest gift recognizing the great gift of baptism, which is the Holy Spirit. And so that's come into a ministry. I was a pastor, associate pastor, and pastor most of my life, and, and never tried to force people into that renewal movement, but preached enough that it at least opened the doors to many. And then served in the diocese as a liaison for charismatic renewals, we call it, kind of a movement in our Catholic Church that is uh, certainly favored by all the bishops and popes. We're talking about uh, after I initially received this prayer and how I deepened it or, or at least allowed the Lord to lead me to deepen it by, I began to say yes to almost any request, whether it's to go to a meeting or pray with people. And I also began to realize kind of a new, uh, people began to see me as one who was not so depressed or sad, but they began to see you're full of joy. And so I began to study a lot more about it and read in scripture and the fruits of the spirit. You know, one of the fruits is joy and kindness and all these things. And so if you're led by the Holy Spirit, you will experience these. So I began to, to witness to those things. And that was not from, it was part of me, but it was the Holy Spirit continuing to lead me. So that has developed into ministries, different ministries uh, over the years. I'm part of the healing and, and deliverance ministry in the Catholic Church. And I assist uh, uh, with a woman named Jane Gunther in lots of praying with people. We get calls all over. I get calls, priests refer sometimes people to me, say this, this woman's come to me and she thinks of this man 
that maybe there's some possession here, but it's beyond my... So it's what I would call, a, a priest is called to be a physician of the soul, and most priests are general practitioners, and so sometimes they'll refer some a need where there's somebody that has a little more experience. So I'm in that category with some of this. Um, and even to the extent of having participated in uh, a somewhat rare, but still it occurs, exorcisms, although I'm not the exorcist for the diocese and do not uh, want to be unless I'm called to be. Well, part of what, part of the, the, the person who influenced the renewal and it's kind of our major teacher, godfather figure, I guess, and maybe those are inappropriate uh, images, but it was uh, Father Francis McNutt, who was a Dominican in those years. And he was one of the early lights that recognized that, and he had come from a, a Protestant family with a, and he had gone to some Pentecostal events and he began to see the fire of the spirit and began to realize uh, as it hit the Catholic church in 1967, through what's called the Duquesne weekend, the whole well, in 1967, in, in I think it was February, uh, there was a group of students from Duquesne University, which is a university run by the Fathers of the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, and they were uh, had decided to go. These were college students. They decided to make a retreat. Now, some people had been praying for them. Some people who had got somewhat influenced, some Catholics with the Pentecostal movement, because uh, much of this had been developing for decades through. Uh, the turn of the century and uh, uh, different streams in Pentecostal and Protestant churches. And so they were praying that these young college students would be baptized or have the Spirit released in them, and that's what happened on this weekend. These uh, 10 or 15 or so, of whom still, some are still living and, and, and have been testifying all over the world ever since, had uh, amazing manifestations of the Spirit. They began to cry and, and uh, experience the, uh, the deeper release of the Spirit, especially the love of God in their hearts that they never experienced before. And they began to pray in tongues, some of the things that are mentioned in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. They began to, to feel a higher power. And so uh, that was in February of 1967, and they, they left that retreat and became evangelists for it. Many of them, some of them just went back to normal, everyday family lives, got married, whatever. But some of them uh, kind of took it elsewhere, and it began to spread like wildfire. It was obviously a thing of God, not of, not of human individuals. And so it, uh, it began to be located in covenant communities at first in the Catholic Church, these are communities where people feel called in different cities to kind of uh, leave behind some of their um, independent living and live together in uh, common resources or whatever. But the main element that all felt called to be led by the Spirit and to receive the total spectrum of the gifts of the Spirit, some of them ordinary gifts that are given to almost all, all people baptized, some extraordinary gifts, like some of healing. Uh, Father Francis McNutt had a very extraordinary gifts of healing and deliverance. So he influenced, and he joined, began to be other leaders throughout the country. This is now the 70s and 80s. And some of these places like Notre Dame and Steubenville, Franciscan University of Steubenville, just to mention two, began to have huge conferences there was part of the 70s and 80s where uh, at Notre Dame University they'd fill up a whole stadium in the summer. Great uh, Catholic leaders like Cardinal Sunins would come over and talk to them. And so these were kind of the, the 70s and 80s were the days where there was great influence. And so Bishops began to take recognition of it and decided they didn't want to try to stifle it or control it, but they just wanted to make sure that it was in pastoral harder. So they began to uh, uh, appoint in every diocese what they called the liaison to Catholic Charismatic Renewal. And they gave their favor of it. They think this is obviously a thing of God. And as time has gone on, more and more bishops said this is not only for a few people, but as our recent popes have said, Benedict and Francis and Pope John Paul, everybody should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it's kind of considered now a 
reactivation of the graces of uh, baptism and confirmation. As you may know, or many know, many Catholics are baptized as infants. They're confirmed a little later, but still as, uh, as, as uh, eighth graders or high school maybe. And then they may get on to other influences of life and kind of forget that they have this great gift of the Holy Spirit. So the renewal is basically to keep reminding people that the greatest gift you have is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift you have received, give as a gift. Uh, and then the scriptures ask and you will receive. I think the, the intention of that is you don't ask just once. You're invited to ask daily for the empowerment and enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. At least that's been my practice. Now everybody has a different kind of way of, of um, incarnating that which means in fleshing it into daily life mine is a, is a morning series of little prayers there's a prayer by cardinal mercier called the secret of sanctity and it goes something like this lord i holy spirit i adore you i love you uh tell me what to do direct my every choice in other words it's a prayer to be led by the holy spirit if you want to experience the fruits of the holy spirit then you the condition is those who are led by the holy spirit will experience these fruits the key there is, are you led by the Holy Spirit? So because in most of us, as we grow up, we're sometimes uh, uh, split identities. There's part of us that wants to be led by the Holy Spirit and part of us that wants to follow our own. And so um, we have the freedom of which, as some uh, Catholic and other writers have said through the ages, we have our deeper self, our true self. We have our or surface self that sometimes wants to control things. Part of that's psychological growing up. It's sort of normal to want to have everything under my control. When you really uh, want to be led by the Spirit, you have to sometimes surrender that control, and sometimes you express that verbally in a prayer. Uh, so I have these prayers when I get up in the morning, and then I've learned throughout the day to kind of uh, add uh, little ejaculation kind of prayers, like, come Holy Spirit, enlighten me, help me to be aware, especially of spiritual warfare and of the needs around me, help me to be aware of my need to you as I'm meeting with this person. Uh, empower me, I learned that through my recovery in alcoholism, I don't have the higher power. Spiritual warfare is a reality that uh, many Christians and certainly many Catholics are kind of unaware of. It's a part of uh, Conversion is a, a awareness of uh, uh, we call sometimes discernment of spirits. We call it uh, from some of our Catholic uh, great spiritual leaders like Saint Ignatius of Loyola had a lot of teaching on discernment, discernment of spirits. So the importance of discernment of spirit is what is coming from, uh, what's affecting you and moving you. Is it of God, the Holy Spirit, or is it your own spirit? Is it, or is it possibly the uh, demonic, the enemy? And so that opens the door to a kind of a reality that a lot of Catholics uh, and, and other Christians have come to kind of believe less in than maybe there is what the Scripture talks about often, what the Scripture talks about especially that our, I think it's St. Paul in Ephesians, our real enemy is not flesh and blood, but the principalities and the powers. That's Ephesians 6, I think. Uh, from on high and so if you really believe that scripture uh, you don't want to be frightened by it or focused on it but I use the analogy sometimes like defensive driving I'm not frightened by being hit on uh, the side but I'm just kind of out of my eye out I'm aware so I uh, the Holy Spirit's helped me to be aware that there are these negative thoughts or these temptations or these whatever where they're coming from as this of God. Uh, and so there's a whole school of thought that talks about uh, by their fruits you will know them. Uh, if, I'm in, if I'm in what is sometimes called a desolation or anxiety, is this from God or is this from my own psychological disorders or is this from the enemy? And sometimes it's, it's sometimes a little of both. Sometimes my own psychological makeup needs to be uh, some, some healing. Healing of Memories, we call it. One of the great ministries in, the, in, in our Charismatic Renewal and in other churches is called Healing of Memories. 
Uh, sometimes I express to people we don't want to live in the past, which means the past affects our present to where in a negative way. Sometimes it could be a wound uh, or a lie that we've taken in in growing up. That's one of the enemy's main tactics is deception. And so sometimes in, in my work of counseling or spiritual direction, I say we need to kind of look at the lies you have uh, taken. We need to reject them and uh, and and be delivered from those lies. So sometimes the ministry is <clears throat> of, of uh, in the Christian life is um, through the help of the Holy Spirit, and that's why my prayer: Come, Holy Spirit, enlighten me. Help me to be enlightened by where I'm being misled, maybe, but especially where I'm being misled to where I don't think that uh, that that I'm a beloved son. That's one of the main lies of the enemy that I'm a that God doesn't love me because I've made some mistakes in the past or whatever. So Holy Spirit, enlighten me and then empower me because sometimes my power is not enough. My willpower is not. So when one goes into treatment, sometimes you go into rehabilitation, which means you learn new habits, and that's good. But in a good uh, recovery program, they'll tell you all the retraining and habits is good, but you need a higher power and in some places to so they can reach people of all religious denominations they just call it higher power but i've learned that it's good to be able to identify the higher power as jesus did when he went to the ascension he said uh, go to the uh, the room the cenacle sen and a power from on high will come upon you so we call that higher power the holy spirit the paraclete and in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus identifies that paraclete not just as kind of an ephemeral spirit, but uh, the counselor, the helper, the defense attorney, all these wonderful attributes of the Holy Spirit. And I think if you can personalize and recognize that uh, I need that counselor, I need that helper, I need that defender. Uh, the enemy is the accuser, the prosecuting attorney is the image used. So life can sometimes be a battle. Now, we don't want to be figure that everything we do is a battle always but just to be aware of spiritual warfare and part of that awareness is that I need a power from on high I need to release that power I have the power but God respects my freedom and if I say thank you God I have thank you for the power but I don't need it today then God will not force that power upon me one of my strong beliefs in growing up uh, was a uh, a deeply held Christian belief of the God of Providence that as I fear uh, one of my negative uh, influences was that I wasn't adequate and so one of the great blessings of the renewal is that God will provide for me where I feel and maybe am inadequate uh, so in my work now I need to call on the Holy Spirit to that I may be a good spiritual director. I need training, I obviously need to use the training, but I need more than just the training to be a better spiritual director, and that's the Holy Spirit. Well, it's part of my life story, which is, uh, you know, as I tell this, sometimes as I give a witness, I, this is my story, everybody's story yeah. is different. Uh, uh, so you don't wanna, uh, when you hear a person's witness, you hear it as a way that God has worked wonderful things in a person's life, but it may not be your story, so you don't want to fall into the trap of uh, of comparisons or thinking, well, I that didn't happen to me or that'll never happen to me. I didn't hit bottom like that. I didn't do all those bad things or whatever. So it's, it's, it's just everybody has a different story, but, but everybody has a need for God. And a lot of times in life when we're successful, and think that things are going well in our relationships. There's there's a wonderful book called The Pursuit of Happiness and says that there are four uh, elements of being a happy or joyful person. One is uh, basic needs being met, and I'm successful in some of my endeavors and um, able to make a living and that I've got relationships of love. And you can get into, if I have all those, I don't need God. But if you understand the human being, and St. Augustine says it well, our, our, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, and the story of many people who have reached the top of wealth and relationships and wonderful marriages, and they still are 
empty. They don't. They've lost in some ways, or they're not paying attention to uh, what's expressed so well in the Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. And that to me means how fortunate are those who know their need for God. Now some of us to find our need for God had to hit bottom. Hopefully other people don't need to hit bottom or, or have serious disorder. Uh, but everybody somewhere in their life, as successful as they may be, as having most of their needs met, hopefully will come into some realization it isn't enough. The deepest need in my life is a need for God and a, and a personal relationship with God, in, especially in Jesus Christ and in His Spirit, and also with God the Father. In our Catholic tradition, many other Christian traditions, uh, we're not just um, one God, the Esther, or we're not just evang uh, evangelicals with only Jesus Christ or other, you know, focus on. A balance is, uh, is, is the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, a loving Father, a beloved Father, like in the story of the prodigal son who's always wanting sons and daughters to come home. And Jesus Christ who became one of us that we might see God, the God we do not see, we see in him. He calls us to um, be like him and incarnate the word in our own lives that we may be Christ to others. And the Holy Spirit given to us when Jesus left his, uh, his last words in his Gospel of John, his parting words mm. uh, where I do not leave you alone, I do not leave you orphans, I will send you another paraclete who will remind you of all that I've taught you and, and help you to live it. So I found in my life I need very much to take that offer and to continue to put it into practice daily, sometimes hourly. I, I'm, I imagine there are people that tried to reach me in high school or grade school. and. Um, Again, I, I grew up in a pretty, uh, a very uh, a wealthy and not that all my school contemporaries were from wealthy families, but sort of means. And it was part of the culture that we had all we needed. And, uh, and it was such a strong culture of uh, the good life was to eat, drink, and to be merry and whatever. I don't know how I could have changed that culture. I, I, I wish maybe I'd gotten out of it sooner. I mean, and I'm sure there were people trying to help me in college. Uh, in fact, I know there were. I can remember people tried to call to my attention that the road I was on was going to lead to hell on earth. And uh, some people who were on the road I was on never got off it. Generation. I would tell this generation what is kind of the message of the season we're in, Advent, which is wake up and uh, wake up to your need for God and the, and the higher power, the Holy Spirit. Uh, how would I get through with that? Uh, and sometimes I ponder that as I meet with nieces and nephews who... Um, There's a thing in our in our Catholic Church that we call uh, not just our Catholic Church, but the uh, that the best uh, teachers are not so much what they teach, but what they witness. So, so in some ways, it's trying to be a, a good good witness. But still, people still need some teaching, some calling out, some encouragement. So that's something I have to work on because sometimes I'll meet with people who are not of who are in this situation with not much of a practicing. Catholic life or Christian life and and I may uh, there's something I learned in recovery that there's the right balance of, of affirming people and loving them and challenging them and sometimes I uh, find myself getting off balance of doing too much of the affirming and not enough of the calling out or challenging sometimes that's called tough love where you I've had a tough time overcoming uh, people pleasing in my life. I want to please people, and sometimes a Christian has to s maybe go through some displeasing people when they speak of uh, if you continue to go this way. It's a scripture we even had today 
and Zephaniah or something, woe is you if you continue this path. Hmm. So I, 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 I think I would in, encourage people to um, yeah, make use of the gift you have, the gift you have received, to, to spend some more time. And uh, one of the ways of doing that is set aside more time for conversation with God. One of the things I've heard in my own prayer is uh, the Lord had asked me, he said, uh, I'd, I'd like you to spend more time in conversation with me and less time in conversation with yourself. So as I look at my own life, I have a lot of conversations with myself. So. Well, in our Catholic and other traditions, we have a great, as the scripture says, great witnesses that are surrounding us. And so some of them that's influenced my own journey is, uh, is a, is to read the lives of the saints. And I have a few little daily reading books that are these pr wonderful little printed books that come out monthly and they'll have the saint of the day or something. And so it's always great to read about extraordinary gifts that some people have. Uh, but some of the main uh, saints in our church that have influenced me would certainly be the one that's in the minds of many people because of Pope Francis, namely Francis of Assisi. As I look at his life, I'm nowhere near, you know, having done what he did, but he had a, maybe a calling I didn't have, maybe to sell everything and follow Christ as a, as a beggar. Uh, I'd certainly like to move closer to his, in his direction of spending less money and giving more money to the poor. And our present Pope is certainly a great icon of that. Then I think the Saint Ignatius of Loyola is another great turnaround saint who lived a very uh, lived a life like I did in some ways, although much more courageously, I guess, as a soldier, romantic, uh, whatever. And then through God's providence, was wounded as I was. I mean, there's a little similarity there. I, I was wounded <laughs> in the journey and in my convalescence from my wounds. That's where I really found the Holy Spirit. But that's what happened to Saint Ignatius. And then he became, uh, he, he moved, he didn't, we, it didn't all happen in one, <laughs> one moment. Uh, his whole life is a series of ways that he uh, allowed God to lead him. Uh, and he went through some times where he was uh, out of order, namely he was out of balance with the scrupulosity and ways that the enemy had begun to work on him. So, but he came through that. He came through to recognize a great, uh, his own experience led him to what's called the spiritual exercises. And the spiritual exercises of what I've studied a lot in my own life, and they've influenced a lot of my own present work, namely helping people discern the spirit. Where is this coming from? Uh, and that's a great gift. That's one of the gifts given in scripture, discernment of spirits. So we can both pray for that, and like all gifts, we can both use our own natural gifts in some ways, but the power of on high helps us to be more than our natural gifts. Um, those are some of the, I guess, two main saints. Uh, there are many others that are, of course, oh, uh, well, and then devotion to Mary, the mother of God. And my devotion to her is like many Catholics that other people of other Christian denominations have a hard time understanding is uh, I don't think we idolize her or make her into another god but we just see her as uh, as one called by God uh, and especially uh, the moment in the Gospels that is most uh, influential to many of us or we seek to make that word more incarnate is where she responded to the invitation to become the mother of uh, the Savior, the mother of God, and her simple fiat in Latin, which means be it done according to thy word. And hearing from the angel, uh, when she was afraid, she was human, and she said, uh, she was troubled. The angel said, do not be afraid. You have found favor with God, because I still have in me a lot of uh, part of me that takes over and wants to control things. So uh, daily I have to keep uh, coming back to a surrender to the higher power, the Holy Spirit. So it's a daily, uh, and I, I guess I would encourage most people to see that. Not not a frightening daily, rigid, you know. One is not a very good evangelist if one looks like one's all frightened or something, but but just a recognition daily, and it's a beatitude. Blessed are those who know their need for God. 
I translate that a little deeper. Blessed are those who know their need for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> How fortunate we are. And I mean that in the sense, I don't think I'm better than anybody else. I'm just very fortunate to have been led to a, a breakdown uh, where I, uh, there's a point in recovery where they call it where you hit bottom. And there's an expression we use sometimes, is often used in recovery call, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, I give up. And that's generally the beginning of the healing where I cease to be the physician of my own uh, life. I surrender to both human beings who are leading me and guiding me and, and who are God sent. So overcoming that I'm gonna control everything is a basic stepping stone to uh, to being a disciple. You ask about other contemporary books and influences, and there's uh, ever since the renewal, and maybe before that, but uh, to my awareness, there are um, hundreds of books now written by Catholics and others about the, the, the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. I've got a library that's full of them, and I often read them to continue to reinforce what I know, kind of, but I need, that's what the value of spiritual reading. I think uh, that's a great asset for most spiritual, for most Christian life is that I will, as I'm able or I'm called to it, uh, balance my day with some kind of spiritual reading. Where that's a way of God talking to us through sometimes other people, whether it's an individual in a conversation or whether it's somebody that's written a book or whether it's the scriptures, of course. Part of praying is uh, Lexio Divina where I, look at the Word of God for that day, and then so what, what is God asking me to focus on? Uh, God, God will tell us if we ask, you know, what do you want me to pay attention to? What word do you want me to incarnate? What word do I read in Scripture that I does not is not me? One of the teachings on prayer that's helped me a lot is from St. Augustine. It's his, uh, his famous letter to Proba. And he answers the question, uh, what people asked him and people ask us today, why do we need to pray for God for anything when God knows everything we need? Why didn't God just give us what we need? And his answer is God knows everything you need, but wants you to ask, because in the asking, you begin to open up your desire. And it's in the more you desire, the more you open to receiving what God wants. If you desire or expect little, you get little. It isn't God that's holding back. It's that you are not open to receiving it. So that's one of the great teachings that's influenced me. Uh, I need to keep asking. I need to keep looking at every day. There's a Ignatian practice of beginning your day with what are you asking for today? What do you desire? Uh, it's a little bit of the scripture that goes back when the, I think it was Andrew and John and Jesus said, what are you looking for? What do you want? They said, well, we, we'd like to follow you. We'd like to, where do you live? You know, well, that was the beginning of expressing, well, come and see. And then he continued to ask, what do you want? Well, we'd like to, you know. So we have to sometimes look into our hearts. What do we desire today? Where do we desire to God to help us? And God will answer that. <laughs> in very uh, concrete ways. And one of my deepest desires is uh, is the incarnation to, and that's a big word, but basically it means the word becoming flesh. Now that's not only in Jesus Christ, but it's in, it's meant that when we read the scriptures or hear God's word, that uh, we pray that it will, the Holy Spirit will incarnate it in us so that we'll live the scriptures that we're praying and living. Uh, to me, that's a great blessing, and I'm far from it. People will know me say, you, you, you're not that word. You're not. <laughs> One of the practices we have in, our, uh, in, in the Ignatian tradition is called the examination or the review of the day. Where, and he's got five steps that are very, I think, very good spiritual exercise. To me, a healthy person is one who does exercises. Not just physical, but spiritual, emotional, intellectual, uh, certainly spiritual. So everybody should have some regimen of spiritual exercise. In fact, I've heard somewhere that a, a Christian is one who is dedicated to some discipline of spiritual exercises in life and committed to, to that daily. Because the enemy will take us away and, and we'll get lazy and 
and, and begin to lose the, the tone of being a healthy person. So the exercise, one of the most valuable exercises in the Ignatian spirituality, which is worldwide, it isn't just for Jesuits or whatever. It's influenced millions. In fact, there's books and movies written about spiritual exercises, but it's called examination or review of the day. It's better, rather than examination, they like the word review of the day, and it's five basic steps. I begin with uh, looking at the day, and uh, I ask the Spirit to enlighten me about my blessings of the day so that I come to some gratitude. So the first step is often uh, gratitude because of so many ways I've been blessed this day or this past 24 hours. And then I ask for the Holy Spirit's light anew to help me to see, and the third step is sometimes where I have missed the mark. That's the Old Testament notion of sin. Where I have uh, not been the Christ today. And that can be, uh, hopefully as years go on, it's, it's overcoming more serious disorders where I may have been into some serious hypocrisy of life or something like that, like the Pharisees or whatever. Uh, or as one grows in the spiritual life, one moves from sometimes the more serious disorders, like my alcoholism that led me into other excesses of life that are typical today in our culture, see in the movies, affairs and all that, uh, to where it becomes hopefully what we call sometimes venial sins, which are, are not serious, they're not mortal, they're not deadly, but if we do not uh, notice them and, and, and seek God's help to make progress, they could become. So, for example, a person may have some little dishonesty or something, and it's not deadly or anything, but but if I don't recognize it and say, you know, I wasn't really honest about that today. I didn't answer that. Uh, there was something in me that wanted to please this person, so I didn't give an honest answer. So I recognize that I have a bit of tendency to want to please people, and that sometimes makes me not tell the truth. So in my review of the day, I can see that, and uh, and that and then I the the, the fourth step I ask God's pardon for that time where I missed the mark I wasn't the Christ maybe it's just a little lack of charity maybe somebody somebody knocked on my door and I just gave him a kind of a gruff answer or was too tired or something or maybe sometimes I, uh, I said yes to something that I shouldn't have it's very sometimes uh, so review of the day is where with the help of the Holy Spirit will catch the ways that we were maybe misled by the enemy in some way. And then the final step is tomorrow is another day and or the next 24 hours because sometimes this review of the day is not done at the end of the day because we're too tired. Uh, sometimes I'll do it in the early morning. I'll review the last 24 hours. So it's giving God permission to kind of break into my life and continually to. And Ignatius calls this the most difficult and most resisted of all the spiritual exercises because it's probably one of the most fruitful, where I give God permission to continue to direct my life and move me out of darkness or fear or where I'm being misled. I, I think I'd want people to remember me as one who is uh, moving toward always wanting to be ever more gr grateful for how blessed I've been in both family and friends and uh, many ways God has provided for me and especially the great mystery of why I among many recovering alcoholics who don't always seem to turn the corner why I was given the grace to be able to say yes to that it's still a mystery to me uh, so I think God would, I would want people to remember me and if they would see faults in me that hopefully they'd see well he he sometimes uh, um, was said yes too much, <laughs> but I'd rather err on that side of, of, of saying yes to people's requests and giving, believing God will provide and that I can keep in balance. Sometimes the enemy can, anyway, you asked me what I would like to be remembered for, uh, that I was um, maybe more and more awake and aware of God's presence and overcome a long life of sometimes being influenced negatively, negative thoughts. Oh, 
Yes, I'd like people to remember me as one who knew he was a beloved son of the Father and that there was a, some sign of the gifts of the Spirit of joy and love and kindness. Well, maybe the favorite scripture, I don't know, I'm not sure this was one. It's Jesus' baptism. When he heard from the Father, you are my beloved son, who I favor, who I take delight. I, I have a belief that every Christian should hear that in their heart. And many of us hear it in our heads, but we don't always hear it in the heart. So it's, it's maybe it goes back to the promise of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, I will give you a new heart and a heart of flesh. And I think that's, to me, is hearing that, the Father's love in the heart. And if you hear that, see, a lot of us who didn't always hear that growing up from our own fathers, whatever, not that we had bad, we just, they, they were good fathers, they just, so uh, it's overcoming whatever we missed. So sometimes some of us have to go through life seeking to be affirmed always or something, because we, and if we really hear that, we never have to, in fact, somebody said to me once, uh, you don't need to impress people just to bless them. <laughs> you don't need to impress them. Sometimes people who need to be affirmed are trying to impress people. So I've come a long, I hope I've come a long way of not needing to impress anybody, but just to bless them. So hearing in the heart, the new heart. Now today I heard from a, a kind of a supervisor and this helped me overcome some negativity because I've always thought, oh, my, I have a hard heart or something. And she said, no, I see Jesus seeing your heart just pumping with love and something. So that was a, a word I needed to hear today. Many Christians who come to see me, not so much the seminarians I see daily, they've come a long way on this, but that they grew up in a, in a in, in sometimes with Catholic guilt, they call it, where they tend to be more feeling of guilty of... Uh, that God is a, is a God that's continuing out to get them or to... Uh, so there's a lack of trust. We even saw this sometimes in, in the... Or when I was in the seminary, there was kind of a sense of be careful or out to get you and you know hide from... you know Don't tell them who you really are. So I think Catholics need to overcome that, whatever feeling that may be. Uh, and yet not go overboard that whatever I do, everything is fine. You know, sometimes that's another part of our culture that... Uh, that uh, it, there's the truth. I mean, it's just, again, they have truth. God loves everybody. But as somebody said, God loves you too much to let you stay where you are. <laughs> so it's continually calling you to be uh, the person you're called to be, which is to be like God. Yeah, one of my favorite scriptures is the Old Testament. We're made in the image and likeness of God. Uh, we will never lose the image even though God may be dead in us as far as we may call ourselves atheists, we'll never lose that image of God. We can lose the likeness. We can act very much not a people of love. And so I think God is continually calling us into the likeness, which again is love. God is love. But it's not just translated into just feelings. <laughs> It's, it's following God's ways, God's laws, and the teaching that our churches, you know, try to incarnate in practical everyday living. You've asked me what is the greatest thing that Catholic Church needs in this 2015 and almost 2016. Uh, I'm gonna connect it with a recent event where the Pope opened the, what's called the Door of Mercy. It started the Jubilee Year of Mercy in, on December 8th. It's a ritual, and the opening a door, going through a door, is kind of a ritual of going through barriers or going into a new space or something. So he's inviting uh, all people, and especially members directly of the church, and certainly indirectly everybody else that wants to listen, uh, to put into focus and practice what is a, a basic virtue of all Christianity and many other, some other religions too, I guess, namely mercy, which means forgiveness and reconciliation, uh, and probably is best expressed in compassion. Somebody said sometimes mercy can be just pitying somebody else, but 
and maybe giving some money to their needs, but not much compassion. So it's probably uh, a need to inculcate that more into my life. Uh, I've said, how am I going to do that? I'm already I think I'm already doing that in some ways. Um, but more and more instances I see of persons coming to me that maybe I turned away that I could have spent some time with and helped them to experience God's mercy. Because so many people don't feel loved by God or others. Uh, so, and the Pope has put it this way, he wants to see a church more, less rigid, more accepting. I don't think he means by that that we just accept people and their lifestyles and everything and that everything they do is fine. When people are doing lifestyles that are destructive or whatever, that's just not mercy to just say that's fine. So uh, it's a bit of the truth will set you free, but it's, it's expressing the truth in love and mercy and continually to say there's always, in other words, it's, it's the Our Father in a way, you know, forgiving people even though it's beyond, you know, time and time again, not in a sense uh, of everything. Still, it's that finding that balance between challenging people to be the person they're called to be and to stop doing what is hurtful, and particularly if it's to oneself or others, and yet, the door is always open for mercy and forgiveness. Um, so that's a big challenge in our church now, and we really need the Spirit to lead us. Because there are times uh, that I've recently been with people, what's merciful, what's, uh, what's speaking the truth in love? What's, and I don't have, a, I mean, I, all I know is that I don't have the answers for that. I just know that the Spirit will provide it if I ask. Or at least come closer to it. So as I spent some time last night with a niece of mine, I'm when I went away thinking I'm not. I don't know. I need the spirit's help. So I, I haven't given up. I will continue to pray for her. So sometimes mercy is uh, when when I'm not successful in my view of success of my witness. I, I don't know whether my witness was effective or not. Maybe I didn't teach. Maybe I did uh, uh, reinforce. I heard somewhere that, uh, that, that real love, particularly to young people, is, uh, is, uh, is listening to them, seeking to understand them, accepting them, but sometimes it's, to, it's not to agree with them when what they're saying is, is wrong or hurtful. How to communicate that with the listening and understanding and acceptance. And that's one of the main things in our Catholic Church today is uh, how can we agree to disagree with people of other faith traditions and still love them? And see that God, one of the great things about Pope Francis, he sees God's working in so many other different people. So it's not forgoing your own faith tradition, but it's just uh, recognizing that God is doing wonderful things with, uh, with other people. And we're just the instruments. And we're hopefully coming more together. So there's great progress, and this is a whole other topic that I won't get lost on, but there's great progress in ecumenical, what's called ecumenical. To all my nieces and nephews and grandnieces and nephews, if you ever see this, uh, know that your uncle loved you and uh, just prays that you find the treasure, maybe your ways, not necessarily mine, but hopefully ways of God, of God's love for you and that somehow you'll incarnate that into your life more in practice and find a church community that helps support that. We can't go to God alone. <laughs>